All right, we're back on. Um, Pastor Hall was just mentioning in the break the, the map, and uh, it's quite a good one. It's, it's the time of Hammurabi, so time of Abraham. Um, so you've got the Babylonian kingdom extending up into Assyrian territory, which either one or the other occurred for, throughout many centuries. Either the Babylonians were pushing north or the Assyrians were pushing south. And when one of them became powerful enough, they would then go this way. And uh, up here you've got the Hittites, who acquitted themselves quite well against these major powers, Egypt and the Assyrians and Babylonians, uh, for quite a long time. Uh, and that's really the contested zone between the, the major powers. And of course, to get to that area, the Egyptians would march up the coast of Canaan. And if these guys got strong enough, they would come down through Canaan to get at the Egyptians. Um, but we did talk about where everybody went after uh, the Tower of Babel, which we haven't actually got to yet. So there's Ur, Babylon, and some of the other early, early cities, Nineveh. Uh, it's, well, cycles of history. Yeah, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, they'll all be back, they'll all be back in Canaan to fight it out again. All right, the descendants of Ham. So we've seen the descendants of Japheth. That was uh, verses 2 through to 5. So we're in Genesis chapter 10. And we're looking at the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim and Phut and Canaan. Ham's descendants went on to dominate Africa, but they were also prominent in other areas. Uh, the Cushites were the ancient Ethiopians. And they also spread into the Arabian Peninsula and further south and west into Africa. So you can see why if, um, oh, Ethiopia is a little bit further down, but it's, I'll say it as if it's nothing, a hop, skip and a jump across the Red Sea into Arabia. So when Moses is um, over here somewhere in Midian, and he meets an Ethiopian who's the priest in Midian, it's not such an unusual thing. Moses' wife was a Cushite. See that in Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. It created an issue with Moses' sister, who got a bit of a bee in her bonnet because her brother had married an Ethiopian woman. Uh, Mizraim gave his name to what is now Egypt. In fact, that was an old name for Egypt, Mizraim. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 14 talks about... Is that right? I might have the wrong verse there. Anyway. Uh, the descendants of Phut also started out in eastern Africa and spread out from there. Canaan's descendants lived in the land of Canaan, funnily enough, which extended from the border of Turkey down to the Sinai Desert. So somewhere there, all the way down. I'm not saying it was all called the land of Canaan, but it was Canaanite territory, as in territory of the descendants of Canaan. The descendants of Canaan even included the Phoenicians and the Hittites. We're just talking about the Hittites, along with all of the other nations from the book of Joshua, which are normally associated with Canaan. The Phoenicians were the expert sailors of ancient times, and they conquered parts of North Africa and much of Spain. So they came out of Tyre and Sidon. They're the great Phoenician cities. These Phoenicians of the Western Mediterranean are called Carthaginians. Who was the most famous Carthaginian in ancient history? Hannibal. Correct, Mrs. Cox. Well done. Hannibal. Hannibal, who 
tried to conquer Rome. Uh, got to the gates of Rome, but that was it. The Romans eventually overcame him, but he gave them all sorts of problems for many years. So that was the Carthaginians. They were Phoenicians originally. The Hittite lands ranged throughout Canaan all the way up into Anatolia, which is Turkey. So there's Hittites, there's sons of Heth that Abraham dealt with um, down near Hebron, which is about there. But the Hittite homelands are here. So depending on how they were going, whether they were having a good century or not, depended on where they were, but uh, at times they were very powerful. The Hittites were descended from Heth. Heth means terrible. Considering the curse pronounced on him by Noah, along with the detailed outline of his descendants in Genesis chapter 10, verses 15 to 19, there's perhaps more on uh, Canaan's descendants than anyone else. The importance of Canaan cannot be understated. Even Sodom and Gomorrah get a mention in his genealogy. So verse 19... And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom, and Gomorrah, and Admar, and Zeboim, even unto Lashar. All of the giants mentioned after the flood were descended from Canaan. Now, I don't know how giants arise after the flood and it's quite limited. It seems to just be two men who then have some sons. Because there's Anak and the sons of Anak are the giants and there's the giant of Gath who has Goliath and his brothers. So how that came about is not uh, put into the scriptures but they were both from Canaan. On a broader scale, the descendants of Ham stayed and contested Mesopotamia with the Shemites in the centuries after the flood. The Japhethites had taken off, itchy feet of course, but uh, the Hamites and the Shemites stayed around for a while and there's descendants of Ham, at least in uh, parts of the Middle East, for a number of centuries afterwards. What nationality was Uriah? Uriah the Hittite, a descendant of Ham. <coughs> Brother Wallace, who's, uh, what's the blank on uh, above Joshua on the previous page? Philistia? Uh, Phoenicians. Phoenicians were descended from Mizraim? Uh, hang on. No, Philistines, that's right. I should have listened to Mrs. Hall. That was Rachel. Sorry, Rachel. You were a ventriloquist, are you? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, the Hamites also went eastward into India, and then a mixed stream of Hamites and Shamites descended uh, down through Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Indonesia, New Guinea, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands. So the people of those areas are a mix. It's one of the great mixing zones. Now, the descendants of Shem, the first thing that the Bible records about the descendants of Shem is the fact that Eber was one of them. What does that sound like? If I said that someone is an Eberu, Hebrew. Genesis chapter 10, verse 21. Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. In fact, Eber was Shem's great grandson. So, why did we skip four generations or three generations there? The reason that he is so important is that the word Hebrew comes from his name. Who's the first man in the Bible to be designated as a Hebrew? Abraham, correct, Genesis chapter 14, verse 13. And of course, he was a descendant of Eber. Back to Shem, Elam was his eldest. I've probably just spoiled the uh, question, but what nationality was Chedo Laoma in uh, 
Is it Genesis 14? Genesis 13? Led that great confederacy that came into the land of Canaan and destroyed the armies of Sodom and Gomorrah and others. He was an Elamite, king of Elam. Uh, Elam was his eldest, Shem's eldest, and his descendants settled in what is now southern Iran. And the Elamites continue, continually come up in ancient historical references. Uh, they come up in Herodotus in the, in the 5th century, I think it's the 5th century BC, uh, in the list of the nations involved in Xerxes' army that invades Greece. So they're still around at that time. Shem's next son, Ashur, was the founder of the Assyrian race and the man who originally built Nineveh. We see that in Genesis chapter 10, verse 11, and a number of other great cities. Ashur's descendants dominated northern Mesopotamia. All right, so there's a city named after him and there's Nineveh that he also built. So basically, Assyrians there, Babylonians there, Hittites there, Egyptians there. If you can keep those four things in your mind, you, you have a fairly good idea of how the Middle East looked. This is Hall. No. You might be thinking because you saw him mentioned in verse 11 in amongst the Hamites that he... No, it just says, out of that land went forth Ashur and builded Nineveh. But if you, where is he? There he is. He's a son of Shem. Well, it is, but I don't think so because the Assyrians were Semitic. The third son was Arphaxad. He's actually the most important because he is the progenitor of the Babylonians. He built Ur of the Chaldees and his descendants dominated southern Mesopotamia and Arabia. It says that in Genesis chapter 10, verse 29. But that's not why he's the most important. Why is he more important? Because Abraham was descended from Arphaxad. That's what... Remember I spoke in the first week about uh, God does not see these great conquerors as being that important. God sees the little folk who have faith and are righteous as being the important ones. Abraham is much more important than a Hammurabi or any of those sort of people. Shem's fourth son was Lud. His descendants dominated the upper reaches of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers and included the kingdom of Mitanni. Now this doesn't have the kingdom of Mitanni on it, but it was about there at one point in history. Shem's fifth son was Aram. What language do you think his descendants spoke? Aramaic? Oh. His descendants straddled the desert areas between Canaan and Mesopotamia. So, through there. As well as possessing territories in parts of the Fertile Crescent from time to time. So, this, everything's shifting, of course, depending on how each group is going, their military successes and failures. Um, I'm giving you just sort of the basic geography, but it's definitely got a lot of moving parts that are constantly moving. Uh, the native tongue, Aramaic, thrived throughout the Middle East for millennia. Uh, Job lived in the land of Uz, meaning he was probably descended from Aram's eldest son, Uz. So, somewhere about there, I reckon. All right, Mrs. Uh, Hall's already pointed out that Ashur was in amongst the wrong genealogy. And here's why. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 10. Well, let's go from verse 6 and we'll run through to verse 11. 
And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim, and Phut and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seba and Havilah. So that's, they were down here in Arabia, further down. And Sabta and Raama and Sabteka and the sons of Raama, Sheba and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Reminds you of those giants, doesn't it? He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So he was so prominent, people were using him as sort of a uh, superstitious saying. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalnah in the land of Shinar. So the land of Shinar is... There, we see Uruk, might be Erech. Out of that land went forth Ashur and builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Kale and Rezin between Nineveh and Kale, the same as a great city. Nimrod is a foreboding figure in amongst the table of nations. He was the son of Cush and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Nimrod means rebel and also panther or leopard, and he was a mighty hunter. He was the 13th from Adam, again pointing to the number 13 as being the number of rebellion. When all the pieces are put together, and we are not going to do that tonight, the picture of Nimrod which emerges is that of a great and terrible dictator. Legends of his Deeds survive in the Gilgamesh epic recorded on clay tablets found in the Royal Library at Nineveh. And his hunting included the hunting of men to become his slaves. The phrase before the Lord does not mean that he hunted in the service of God or in a way that pleased God, merely that he did it openly and defiantly in the sight of God. After the testimony of the flood, just a few generations previous, Nimrod was more than willing to flaunt his wickedness in plain sight. He presumably used the slaves to build his cities, Babel, Erech, Akkad and Kalne, establishing a model for every tyrant which followed after him. Micah chapter 5 verses 5 and 6, which I might read, show that Nimrod ruled Assyria most likely with Ashur as his vassal king, because we just saw that Ashur went and built that city. Just find Micah. Micah chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Um, and this man shall be the peace. This, this is the Antichrist uh, in type. When the Assyrian shall come into our land, when he shall tread in our palaces, then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. So there's a prophecy about the Antichrist. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. So the Assyrian is a, uh, a phrase used for the Antichrist or for a type of the Antichrist. And so Nimrod is definitely that. So that verse in Micah identifies Nimrod uh, with the Antichrist, making him the second type of the son of perdition given in the scriptures. Who was the first one? Already covered one. Well, if the devil... Sorry? Oh, he is definitely a type of the Antichrist, or there's a connection anyway. Not Lamech, no, but someone who Lamech, 
uh, quoted. Cain. Yeah, Cain is the first type of the Antichrist in the Scriptures. Nimrod is the second. All right, let's move on to the Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 11. I'll just read a few verses. Verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. Now, can we just go back to that map for one minute, please, Rachel? Now, here's the land of Shinar. East, from the east. What's east of Shinar? That's the Zagros Mountains. Starts there, ends about there. The traditional site for Noah's Ark is up here somewhere. It's the wrong direction. Yeah, somewhere there. Well, that's what it says. They journeyed from the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us, notice the let us, let us. Let us build us a city and a tower. No one ever talks about the city. No one ever talks about the city of Babel. It's always the tower of Babel. Uh, a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. <laughs> God has a sense of humour. What are they saying? Go to, let us. Go to, let us. Go to, let us. What does God say? Go to, let us. Go down. And there, confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. It doesn't say the tower, it says the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Sometime between Noah leaving the ark and the rise of Nimrod, the entire human population had moved as one from that area of the Zagros Mountains into the land of Shinar, which is southern Mesopotamia. Now, man would never get to this level of cooperation again until the United Nations was created in the late 40s. At some point, Nimrod... Oh, can we um, go forward? Yeah, to that one. Uh, some people say it's Sargon, the king of Akkad, and it says that Nimrod built Akkad in uh, Genesis chapter 10, verse 10. I'm not so sure. It doesn't quite fit as far as my figuring of history. But what's really interesting, this um, mask of Sargon, look at the left eye. Doesn't the Antichrist have a damaged left eye? Just interesting, isn't it? Anyway, I, I don't think that's Nimrod, but some people do, and they put a pretty good case. So I'm not going one way or the other on that one, but um, potentially. Uh, at some point, Nimrod, the son of Cush, the son of Ham, became the dominant figure. He built the cities of Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Calne in Genesis 10.10. 10. Genesis 11 is illuminating as the decisions to build the city of Babel and its tower apparently come from popular, popular opinion. Let us, let us, let us. This demonstrates Nimrod's, because the previous chapter said that Nimrod built Babel, didn't it? Nimrod's amazing ability to drive his agenda forward under the guise of giving power to the people. Isn't that how the best, the best, the worst, the politicians work, isn't it? Oh, we're going to let the people run it, but it's really their agenda. His initiatives were popular, not with the Lord, but with the people. 
and the people were willing to commit to these projects wholeheartedly. The technology used was baked brick and a type of mortar. Now that is not what it looked like. That is not what it looked like. Can we go forward just one? That's what it looked like. And that's made out of baked brick. That's at Ur. That's a ziggurat at Ur. It would have been something like that, the tower. Uh, the technology used was baked brick and a type of mortar. The attitude was self-important. Let us make brick. Let us build a city and a tower. Let us make us a name. In Genesis chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. They were emulating the antediluvians as they wanted to be men of renown, just like the giants. The city had the populational purpose of holding the people together. Sydney does the same thing. Why do so many crazy people jam into such a small space? Because the city holds them together. I used to be one of them. When I lived in the inner west, anything beyond Strathfield was the sticks. Till we moved out there. <laughs> anyway. Uh, the tower had a religious purpose, whose top may reach unto heaven. That's verse 4 of chapter 11. Uh, it was a pyramid. That is a type of pyramid. And probably in the ziggurat style, which you see there. The attitude of mankind was proud defiance of God's known will. They knew that the Lord wanted them to spread out across the earth, but they were disobedient. I mean, they even referenced it in verse 4. They're doing this, lest we be scattered. They knew they were supposed to scatter. And they felt that this was a way they could avoid doing that. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. As is always the case, the wicked imaginations which lead to wicked actions were the problem. The imagination is man's problem. If things were allowed to continue pretty soon, mankind would be right back where he was before the flood. That was too soon for such total apostasy and degradation to occur again. It's only in the last days that society will once again become like the days of Noah. So the Lord God came down to survey the scene and he proclaimed that soon nothing will be restrained from them. No wickedness. They will not be restrained. God pinpointed the imagination and the unity of the people as being the greatest concern. So problem is that man has a wicked heart and at this moment they're united so they'll be able to harness that unity as power and do terrible things. While man's evil imagination is untamable, his unity, however, is easily broken. Human unity relies on the ability to communicate effectively. Now, there's a lot of irony involved in what the Lord says. The perfectly united Holy Trinity said within itself, Let us go down, I already mentioned that, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And it's a law of history that men tend only to trust and empathize with those who speak their own language. In one stroke, mankind became hopelessly divided over language barriers and Nimrod lost his control over humanity. Mankind would be restrained and his wickedness contained within nation states for the next 4,000 years. And what's one way that God makes sure that things don't get too out of hand? Is that they're so busy fighting each other, they don't have time to imagine too much. For the inhabitants of Babel, the situation was intolerable. They could not talk to each other, let alone cooperate together. You know how it is when there's people speaking in another language? What are they saying? Probably not even talking about you at all. Or maybe they are. You don't know, do you? While some of the Shemites and Hamites remained in Mesopotamia, everyone else left Babel. From thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. So I made it to Scotland. 
Some made it to South Africa. Some made it to New Zealand. Some made it to Siberia, lucky. Some made it to South America. But they certainly scattered. On a side note, in many of the places that the Shemites went, they built pyramids. Let's have a look at these, Rachel. So that's Egypt. That's Cambodia. That's Angkor Wat. Now, it looks a bit flat to be a pyramid. And when we went there, I'd done some reading, and they kept talking about these pyramids. And I think, these aren't pyramids. They're too flat. But when you go there and climb up them, you get it. These are actually pyramids. Um, I was surprised. I, I was a history teacher. Well, the underneath, these little towers are just coming off a bigger structure that's actually that. And you don't understand it. You actually sort of climb through it. You come out at about that level, then you go around the back and there's a, a staircase up to the top. And when you get to the top, you go, oh, I get it. This is a pyramid. Now, uh, what else have we got? That's Cambodia. That's Angkor Wat in Cambodia. It's, um, it's built on a swamp, and they, they rely on the, the weight of it all keeping it in place. And it's, it's amazing. It's quite amazing. How do you spell that? Angkor? A-N-K-O-R-W-A-T. I took a million photos. I'll give them. <laughs> you, you don't want to see them all. Uh, what's the next one? Okay, that's China. Um, that's not a photo. That's a computer reconstruction. That's the tomb of the first emperor. It's actually covered in grass, but that's what they think it looks like underneath the grass. So they've been into the tomb. You've seen the terracotta warriors, pictures of the, that's what's inside there. Uh, but it's covered in grass at the moment and the Chinese are still debating exactly how they're going to ex excavate it. But that's uh, what the archaeologists think it probably looked like before it got covered. What's the next one, Rachel? Oh, that's Mexico. Tenochtitlan, again, built in the middle of a lake until the Spanish came along and, and conquered it. Cortez. I didn't do American history. <laughs> Cortez, I think. All right, so um, they built pyramids. The Shemites, wherever they went, from Egypt to Mesopotamia to China to Southeast Asia to Central and South America, the inspiration of Babel was still alive in their hearts. Well, this is all too familiar, isn't it, this apostasy? Well, the history of Pete's or just rhymes, the feeling of deja vu, which means already seen, is ever present. Mankind's utter spiritual failure so soon after the flood clearly demonstrated that not only could he not be trusted to live by conscience, he also could not be trusted to govern himself righteously. The Lord began to develop the conditions necessary for the emergence of a nation which would live under divinely appointed laws. No prizes for guessing what nation that was. This nation would be a righteous example to the nations around it. Those nations would be instructed by God's dealings with his people. The first step in this process was to call forth a man who would be blessed with eternal promises regarding his descendants and their homeland. This man would walk with God as Enoch and Noah had done. And he would be a man of faith. His example would echo down the generations until the day of the Lord. We still talk about Abraham, don't we? Of course, it's Abraham. His genealogy is given in the second half of Genesis chapter 11. It begins like the four previous genealogies. So we're in verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. This time it's Shem. Uh, Japheth and Ham have fallen by the wayside. While a minority of Ham's descendants continued to call on the Lord and attempted to live righteously, we should notice this in Genesis, 
Abimelech and his Philistines in the time of Abraham, they're still trying to be righteous. In general, the Japhethites and the Hamites would be in the spiritual wilderness until the church age. And eventually, even most of the Shemites failed to follow the Lord as well. Well, let's look at the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old when he left the ark, although I will say something about that in a few minutes. And two years later, he had a son, Arphaxad. The descendants of Arphaxad secured southern Mesopotamia, including Ur of the Chaldees and the Arabian Peninsula. Arphaxad's grandson was Eber, the father of all the Hebrews. Eber's son, Peleg, was born 101 years after the flood about the time that God confounded human language at the Tower of Babel. Peleg means divided. So he's either named to commemorate that great dividing of the languages and the people at Babel or to prophesy this event. Because it says in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 19, in his days the earth was divided. So... I'm not sure if uh, his father knew what was coming or uh, it had already happened and then he was named. Abraham was born in Ur of the Chaldees only five generations further on, which was not such a long time anymore. We're not talking about generations of hundreds of years. We're talking about every 35 to 40 years the next generation is being born. The lifespan of post-Diluvian man kept getting shorter and he was having children much younger than the antediluvians. In fact, the shortening lifespans after the flood can be fitted to an exponential decay curve. Oh, Rachel, spot on. So these are the ages. Who's that? 600? No, no one's up here. That's Shem. Okay, and then these are the descendants, and then it has any decay curve, drops steeply, then it flattens out. And what does it flatten out at? Who's that? Oh, that's 32 centuries. That's now. Is that right? No. No, it's Middle Ages. 1000 AD, roughly. So it uh, may be a little bit of an uptick at the moment, but not much. But that's an exponential decay curve. Trust me, I'm a maths teacher. So, so Noah was... <laughs> Higher. No, 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 I mean, Noah's time frame was what BC? Um, so Noah was born just after 3000 BC. So that's, um, that's 32 centuries later than is, is uh, just after the time of Christ. Ah, yes. Yes, is that right? Yes. That is correct. I miscounted. I was going from 2000 at about the time of the flood, but uh, you're right. It's born centuries after Noah. Yes, you read it correctly. Ah, I didn't catch a mistake. <laughs> That's all right. The main point is the, uh, the age has dropped off very quickly and it fits quite uh, well into a scientific mathematical decay curve, which is quite interesting. Could um, eating meat have anything to do with that? Because I've done studies on oh, okay. vegetarians and they say vegetarians have longer, live longer than meat eaters. I think but eating... Not, not I think eating less to a certain... Yeah, less uh, calories. If you eat less, you'll live a little bit longer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other suggestion well, is... live a little less. Oh, no. <laughs> well, if you eat too much less, you don't live longer. You live shorter. <laughs> Got to have a bit of balance here. Um, the other suggestion is the climatic conditions were different. And we talked uh, a little while ago about that guy who went in that capsule under the water and it was like his age reversed. He didn't not only didn't age, he actually got 10 years younger in sort of all these measures. So, yeah, maybe that. So did they measure the telomeres in um, genes? Yes, they, they yes. 
Yes, that's correct. They grew. I did read that. Yeah. I didn't really understand it, but I knew he got younger and it was... What got longer or what got... <laughs> Tell them uh, Go home and look it up. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. I have a comment when, when we're ready. All right. Well, I'll keep going and you, you put your hand up when you're ready to yeah. make your comment. Um, what did I get up to? Oh, yes, the exponential decay curve. Something had happened during the flood which had changed things dramatically. Most likely the removal of the water canopy above the atmosphere had eliminated a protective barrier which had slowed down ageing. So with that protection gone. That's the theory. Now human lifespans would decrease until the time of Moses who lived the maximum 120 years. Now we have just a little something to finish off with and this is a question about when Abraham was born. So Genesis chapter 11 runs through the genealogy down to Abraham. Let's go to verse 26 and we'll read through to the end of that chapter. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Ah, we have another resetting of the generations. Terah begat Abraham, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. So that's where Lot came from. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity, in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. Now, what seems to have happened in verse 29 is that Abram and Nahor bound up the family inheritance. There were these two women uh, for whatever reason, who needed to be uh, cared for within the family. One was the half-sister of Abram and Nahor, that's Sarai. So it seems that Abram, there's only 10 years between Abram and Sarai, so if Tira had two wives consecutively rather than at the same time, it seems that Abram might have been born and then his mother died within 10 years Tira remarried and then Sarai was born from that second marriage. The other explanation is there was two wives at the same time, which is possible. Uh, Nahor marries his brother's daughter, which suggests to me that Haran is older. Not only did he die first, but also his daughter was of marrying age for his brother. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but Sarai was barren. She had no children. She, is, she had no child. She's the first barren woman of the Bible, seven of them, and they all represent Israel, which is spiritually barren at the moment. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, also his daughter, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. Actually, we won't. We'll have a look at that next week. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So the question is, when was Abraham born? He's the son of Terah. He's born in the ninth generation after the flood. And he's named in the genealogy along with his brothers, Nahor and Haran, that's in verse 26 of chapter 11, in a similar way to Shem, Ham and Japheth in Genesis chapter 5 verse 32. So one interpretation is that each set of brothers was a set of triplets. We considered that last week, that Shem, Ham and Japheth were triplets. Now that works fine for Shem, Ham and Japheth, that is plausible but it has significant difficulties with Abram, Nahor and Haran. I'll explain why. Abraham was 75 years old when he left the city of Haran, says that in Genesis chapter 12 verse 4. 
And Acts chapter 7 verse 4 says he left when his father died. Genesis chapter 11 verse 32 says that Terah lived to be 205 years old. So that would mean that Abraham was born when Terah was 130 years old. So there's a mathematical shortfall here. Genesis 11 verse 26 says that Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor and Haran. Now, if you're writing the Septuagint, you just change Terah's age in Genesis 11:32 to 145 years old and that's all neat. Just shows the corruption of that particular um, translation. It's a bit too neat. This is one of many corruptions of convenience in the Septuagint, along with all of its other corruptions. And origin is the likely source. He did that. Anytime he saw what he thought was a, a problem in the Bible, he just fixed it up. A better explanation is that the most significant person, Abram, is listed as the first of the three brothers. I mean, who are we going to be looking at for the next however many, 14 chapters? It's not Nahor and Haran, it's Abraham. That's why he comes first. Haran died quite early back in Ur of the Chaldees. Nahor married his daughter Milcar. So Haran was probably the eldest. And he was probably the one who was born when Terah was 70 years old. Abraham was born 60 years later. And Nahor was probably born somewhere in between. Now, of course, you could apply this same pattern to Shem, Ham and Japheth in Genesis chapter 5, verse 32, rather than viewing them as triplets. Now, I don't mind either way. If the eldest is put last, as, as Haran was in Genesis 11, verse 26, that makes sense, because then it's Japheth, which matches Genesis chapter 10, verse 21. If the most important brother comes first, that makes sense. Abraham comes first, Shem comes first. Now, this would make sense as it's the line of Shem which is listed from Genesis 11 verses 10 to 32. And then if we look at Genesis 11 verse 10, this could be interpreted as saying that Shem was 98 years old at the flood. Japheth would have been 100, making him two years younger than Japheth. So this is all plausible. Um, plausible is the, the key word. It's not fact. We don't no. We should never be too pedantic about these sorts of details derived off limited information. Now the other thing to keep in mind is Old Testament Hebrew structures and idioms are foreign to us. This is not how we speak. We should give them the benefit of any doubt rather than just presuming that the ancients can't add up. All those Hebrew scholars, they couldn't even get the numbers right. Or maybe there's more to it that we don't understand. We should also be aware that the unbelieving scholars love to fish around in these genealogies, attempting to find inconsistencies so that they can accuse the Bible believers of putting their faith in a book which has mistakes in it. Certainly the apparent stump... You ever thought of it this way? Maybe God put these things in there to get rid of those people so they would expose themselves. The apparent stumbling blocks in the genealogies are very effective at exposing the wolves who attempt to run around in sheep's clothing. Therefore, we should know something about the issues which they bring up so that we can provide a thoughtful response. So we should be aware of these things. We should consider them, think them over, and maybe have a thoughtful response. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we shouldn't worry too much about it, but we should try to have an explanation if we can. There's another, um, there's more, more of these that we'll consider throughout the Old Testament, but that's uh, one that we should be aware of. All right, we've run a bit over time. Let's, oh, Pastor Hall, yes? The Hebrew idioms and what else did you say? Idioms and structures, I believe, I think I said. Yes, Old Testament Hebrew structures and idioms are foreign to us. Uh, we're Japhethites. We speak English. They 
very much a language of Japheth, a German language actually. We don't speak the same way that e the the Hebrews e <laughs> the Hebrews speak. <laughs> All right, let's close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, these details from the very ancient past and Lord, I pray that you'd uh, show us things out of your word as we continue with this series. Pray you bless us and uh, be with us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.